Hello, everybody. I'm Logan Crawford, and this is the award-winning TV talk show right here on Ebru. Fresh Outlook. Today, we are talking about gun violence, mass shootings, and how to prevent them. After the slaughter, the recent mass shooting at Umpqua Community College in Oregon, President Barack Obama seemed angry, rattling off all the names of the other communities where similar gun violence has occurred. Columbine, Virginia Tech, Fort Hood, Tucson, Aurora, Sandy Hook, Navy Yard, Isla Vista, Charleston, and now Roseburg. It's a ponderous list. Let me say hello to the Fresh Outlook Think Tank. I am joined by Joe Blatler, a former police detective, Kevin Caligara, a former NYT police officer, Janie Feldman, a psychologist, and joining us live via Skype, Casey McBroom, a highly respected criminal defense attorney, partner of the Los Angeles-based law firm Cadian LLP. Uh, Kevin, you're right across from me. I'll start with you. How do we stop this stuff? I think uh, we need to take a number of different steps. I think the first thing is we have to maybe have a uniform approach to how we give out gun permits. You know, uh, I think there's some lacking uh, areas in, in that process, one of them being mental health. I don't think we're ever going to stop gun violence. You know, hopefully that would be the goal of all of us. But in being practical, I think the big issue is trying to have a little more control over how we give out permits and at the same time on a people's right to carry weapons under the Constitution. Janie, I say it's not the guns, I say it's the crazy people who have the guns. What's wrong with our society that we have so many people who are angry, so many people who suffer from some sort of, sort of mentally, uh, mental illness, they're able to function in society but yet they plot these mass crimes. Um, what are your thoughts as a uh, psychologist? Well, I got to tell you, it's not just about the gun regulation, but really it's about the stigma, the stigma of getting help when you have a mental problem. We call it mentally ill, and right there it sounds like it's an awful thing. And if we could make mental health um, services more accessible, and if we could destigmatize de anyone getting help, then more people would avail themselves to it. There's good help out there if people would take advantage of that. And um, it comes down to the stigma. Joe, you got a young man living with his mother in a one bedroom apartment with 13 weapons and body armor. She knows her kid's a nut. Isn't it incumbent upon her to one, stop him from stockpiling all those weapons. Two, let somebody know he's got a problem. Three, contact law enforcement. Four, get him to somebody like Janie who might be able to help him. Absolutely, I think there's a lot of um, individual responsibility here. Um, a lot of these shooters, there's pre-signs that they're not acting normally. Um, in this particular case, he had all these weapons, body armor. Where were the parents? Where was the mother? Why wasn't she calling police? The mother was there and apparently was boastful at times about the weapons she kept in the house herself which I find disturbing. You know, she, obviously this person had mental health issues. Um, and again, where is the mother getting him help? Um, to me, that's the big issue in this whole argument, the mental health component. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to find answers to the mental health approach. Um, like she said, a lot of people do not want to go um, to the doctor because they don't want to be labeled. You know, I have mental illness and then you have lose job opportunities. You know, a lot of people, you know, I read some studies that a majority of Americans suffer from some type of mental illness, whether it's anxiety, depression, you know, something. It doesn't mean you're crazy and you go shoot somebody. So exactly. we have to find a balance. We have we to find a Janie balance. pick up on that quick, then we're going to turn to Casey. I saw it was registering with you, Janie. A absolutely. What's really important, and with all due respect, when we use words like crazy or nuts or wacko or psycho, that, that increases the stigma because people who come into my office, they say, I'm not crazy, I don't belong here. Sometimes they do. Right. Um, but in, in mental health, in, in my office and in lots of offices, we see everyday people like ourselves, and, and maybe some of us have a little bit more difficulty. But to use those words kind of creates a wedge between us and them, and, and then they don't want to come and get help. And a lot of it's done out of anger. I'm mad at this guy in yes. Oregon who killed 10 people, slaughtered yes. them, asked them their religious views, and executed them. So that's what we tend to label them, but you make a good point. Let's turn to Casey, our uh, legal expert on all of this. Casey, what What's your take on this debate that is shaping up in America about gun control and uh, mass shooters? Sure. I think one of the issues that we, we need to pay attention to is um, 
assault weapons versus non-assault weapons. Um, I think people are focusing on that too much. What distinguishes an assault weapon, for instance, in California from a legal semi-automatic rifle is pretty much negligible. Okay, so people are legally permitted to own, possess, purchase assault weapons for all intents and purposes. And so the issue is not really what's an assault weapon and what is an assault weapon, but whose hands are they getting into. And to sort of piggyback on the issue of mental health, I think what we need to ask ourselves as a nation is are we willing to give up some degree of our privacy rights um, concerning mental health uh, in order to preserve and exercise our Second Amendment right? Uh, we have laws here in California where people who have been committed voluntarily or involuntarily can't have access to weapons. The question is, should it go further? Should certain diagnoses be disclosed? Um, that's going to have, we're going to have to do some HIPAA waivers and really evaluate whether we're willing to give up some degree of privacy. Casey makes a lot of good points here. Kevin, one of the points she makes is we make all of these arguments about assault uh, weapons and rifles and semi-automatics and automatics. The problem is not that. The, pro the problem is cheap handguns. And six people will die in Baltimore this weekend. Twelve people will die in Detroit this weekend. Four people will die in Philadelphia this weekend. And uh, three people will die in New York City this weekend, all by gun violence, all by inner city violence, all by cheap handguns. That's really the problem. I believe the last couple of mass shootings were actually done with handguns, and there wasn't any automatic weapons involved. And, and I agree automatic with you. weapons almost never involved. They're impossible to get, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's gotten a lot harder. I think the issue with the HIPAA is that we need to come up with some uniform way of doing this and coming up with some uh, definition of what mental illnesses need to be disclosed. And I know there's going to be gray area, and I know that we've spoke briefly about this where, you know, if people are declined, there needs to be some type of a appeal system which is made up of a board of professionals who can hear that person's argument as to what their mental illness is and why or why not they should be allowed or not to be carrying weapons. I think the problem also, and I need to stress this, is that, you know, we're so involved, every state has a different law. You know, there's no uniformity to it. There's no uniformity to the system. And that's going to lead into the problem of eventually states' rights being usurped, you know, usurped, because the federal government at some point is going to have to step in. So in a lot of ways, I think the NRA is cutting off its notes despite its face. Let's turn to Janie now. Janie, a lot of people are blaming antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, psychotropic drugs, for creating a people out there who are angry, suicidal, homicidal. They're pointing to the medications used to mm -hmm. treat these people. It's labeled on the medicine might increase homicidal or suicidal tendencies. Do you think this is a real threat or are the people taking the drugs just predisposed to being violent and suicidal in the first place? You know, that's a really interesting question, but let me frame it this way. In terms of violence, we, we don't uh, go after the cars when there's been a drunk driving accident. We have to go after the driver. And so to just diminish it to a situation where it's the medication takes away from the root cause as to why a person is taking medication, as well as the very important factor that people need therapy. Because pills don't teach you anything ever. Therapy teaches you how to cope, how to deal with life, how to deal with people. And so if therapy were something that people would embrace even more, then there might not be as much of a need for medication, but that's pushed by big pharma. So that's a whole industry backing that. We turn to Joe and ask him about gun-free zones. Are they basically a sign to killers saying, come here, we can't defend ourselves? In some cases, yes. I believe in the Aurora case, that shooter actually went 40 miles out of his way to find a gun-free movie theater. Uh, we were talking about this before the segment. Here in New Jersey, I'm a gun owner. I have a permit to carry a gun because I'm a retired officer. I qualify twice a year. I have to submit to a mental health form every year, fingerprinted every year, and yet I'm not allowed to take my gun into a school. I'm not allowed to take my gun into a federal building. I'm not allowed to take my gun into a courthouse. So I, I, I'm an adjunct professor. Mm -hmm. When I teach, I can't bring a gun in the classroom. Now, if I had an active shooter situation, there's nothing I can do because the state of New Jersey has gone overboard. They're saying that nobody can carry a gun in a school. To me, that, that's a little absurd. Well, see, there's a laws that don't make sense. I want you in the classroom with mm -hmm. me packing. 
You're qualified. I want Chris Mintz, who stood up to the shooter in Oregon and said, you're not getting past me. I want that man armed. He was a member of the military. He's qualified to carry a handgun. He shouldn't be uh, denied the right to bear arms. So this is why this is such an explosive debate here in America. Casey, if you're in a movie theater, don't you want somebody like Joe or Kevin here armed? Or do you want to be in a gun-free zone where only the killers will have guns? Well, that opens kind of a Pandora's box of potential legal issues. Um, suppose someone is injured. Um, by the do-gooder as opposed to the bad guy. Um, you know, when people are trading gunfire, bad things happen. Yeah, there's the chance that the person could be disarmed and taken down, but there's also the chance that uh, there could be some unwanted injuries and deaths resulting in, in further, further legal issues. And again, I think you know, we can't stop violence, we can't stop someone who's intent on doing a mass shooting from obtaining a gun and doing what they're going to do, but we certainly can, can slow these down. We can, we can make things much harder um, for people who have a social, mental issues to acquire these weapons. Kevin, you've been in law enforcement for a lot of years. What do you see that's changed in our culture that has made people more violent, more ready to use a gun? We have a faster society than we today than we ever had. We've had more media where everybody is on their iPhone, everybody is, uh, you know, their attentions are different. I don't think the home is the center as much as it used to be, so you don't have the conversation over the dinner table, you know, and I think that those things have hurt our society. So the breakdown of the family depictions of violence in movies and in uh, and the media. video games. The media, I hate to and, say it. But oh, I no. absolutely think that, I won't even say the creep's name, I won't call him crazy anymore, I'll call him a creep instead. I won't say <laughs> the creep's name in Oregon because uh, he doesn't deserve the spotlight. That is what this man wanted. Janie, why are people so full of themselves these days that they want to get attention in any way possible? We live in a time of self-entitlement and it's all about me. Immediate gratification, taking a selfie picture, all of this stuff, um, because we, we are entitled and we have to have our way. So we're not, uh, the guy who didn't get the girlfriend, couldn't get a girlfriend, so he, he's got to take it out on other people because it's not his fault. The blame is cast elsewhere, and it, it goes from, in the media, it comes from politicians, all kinds of leaders are, are just um, le really letting us down by not being able to step up and say, yes, this is what I've done and I'm taking responsibility. How often do we hear that? We don't hear it very often. Jill, what's your answer to the problem? If you're going to get, you know, talk to me like I'm four years old and explain how we're going to stop gun violence in the country. Unfortunately, it? I don't think we're going to stop it because currently, I think the last estimate, there's 280 million guns on the streets of America. You know, every time there's a mass shooting, it takes the focus. But the real issue is, like you said earlier, the handguns. You go to Chicago, for example, any given year, 500 people are being murdered, mostly minorities. Um, yet, I don't see the president outraged about that. I, I don't see anybody out. And, and, and I was reading an article today in Chicago that the superintendent of police wants stricter gun control laws. And African-American legislators said no because it only result in more African-American males going to jail. That's an obscene, obscene argument because it's black on black murders. If people are killing people with guns, they should go to jail. But yet in Chicago, they don't want to pass legislation to put people in jail for three years for carrying a gun. The political correctness of our society has gotten so insane that we can't talk about facts without being labeled sexist, race, uh, racist, misogynist, and so on. It's a big problem. And, and I think going back to the whole anger issue in America, we we definitely become a, a more angrier country. And you take the current political atmosphere, Donald Trump, for example. In my opinion, he doesn't offer solutions. He just attacks people, belittles people, bullies people. And yet, 25% of Republicans want to vote for him to be the president. So that goes to show me, like, Donald Trump is just into name calling, um, attacking people on Twitter, offers no solutions, but yet he has all this following in America. He's tapped into the anger and the disassociation that a lot of people feel like the country is slipping away from them. They're trying to hold on. He's a reactionary, and he's tapping into the reactionaries out there. Let me just turn to Casey for a final thought. Casey, what is your solution? Uh, uh, give me the $64 million answer. How do we stop all this stuff from happening, all these mass killings? There's a few things. One thing we can do, which we do in California, is we have pretty severe enhancements for uh, 
gun use during the commission of a, a, another crime, like a robbery, an isolated homicide. Um, we can think about, in terms of these shooting sprees and mass shootings, um, making it a felony offense for a parent to allow access um, to guns to people who shouldn't have them in their hands, people with a mental health history. In California, it's, it's a felony if, if uh, uh, someone under 18 gets a hold of a loaded gun and injures themselves or others. Um, also, I think, as I mentioned before, I think we need to talk about HIPAA and think about maybe foregoing some privacy rights um, and having more, uh, you know, sharing information concerning mental health history as part of the background check when purchasing a gun. All right, Casey, thank you so much for joining us today. Kevin Caligara, thank you so much for being here as well. Joe Blaitler, appreciate your time. Janie, you're coming back. We, after we come back, we're going to be talking about life after a traumatic brain injury. We're going to hear from some survivors. After this.